Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York. Thank you for joining us in another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. Today's Just Conversation is the first in a series of conversations with a member of a cohort of 12 scholars, faith leaders, artists, and activists who have come together in a project sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation to reflect on religion and racial justice, expanding the moral imaginary through film, and to share their research and work. It is a distinct pleasure to welcome to this conversation today my colleague and friend, Dr. Amy Victoria Atkins-Jones. Dr. Atkins-Jones is a theologian and Black Studies scholar with expertise in Mariology, theological anthropology, and womanist and Black feminist thought. Her research specifically considers Black Madonnas and iconography, human trafficking, the prison industrial complex, racial justice, visual culture, and artificial intelligence. She is a practicing birth worker, a trained iconographer, and has a career background in UX copywriting and design. Outside of academia, Dr. Atkins Jones is a Baptist minister who frequently preaches and teaches around the country. A displaced Southerner, as she describes herself, she joyfully builds community and hospitality between Boston, Massachusetts and Newark, New Jersey, I welcome you to this conversation today. Thank you for joining me, and I know we'll have much to talk about. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored and excited, as always, to see you and to chat. Hello well, out there, all of the invisible people. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So let's jump right in. All right. And begin with your work on Mariology, particularly the Black Madonna. When we speak of the Black Madonna, there is a distinction between iconography in which the Virgin Mary is depicted as Black, though I always say historically such depictions are closer to her appearance as a fair complexion blue-eyed uh, Madonna. But there's a distinction between those depictions and the Black Madonnas, a great majority of which to my knowledge are found in European countries. Black Madonnas go back to at least the medieval period. So my question is this, Amy Victoria, where did these Black Madonnas come from, especially given the whitewashing of Christian images and iconography that has happened across history? All right, yeah, jumping right in. So <laughs> first, I always uh, think that it's important to say that we have many, many rich traditions um, in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Coptic or Orthodox Church of Marian images, um, of images of Christ as well, but images of Mary with dark skin, with black skin. And so um, all the idea of a sort of post-colonial moment of enculture, enculturated images is not really necessarily telling the story around images and people and histories throughout all of uh, Christianity. But that being said, some of the most popular and the most um, contentious Black Madonna figures, and those include images, statues, shrines, um, are, are uh, present throughout Europe. There are over 300 formal uh, Black Madonnas. Um, that number sometimes goes closer to, to 400 um, as particularly named and uh, venerated uh, or by the Roman Catholic Church. And so I get this question a lot, one, because I'm not Catholic, um, uh, but two, um, because uh, in terms of Black theology, which is largely known as coming out of Protestant um, Black church folks um, in the United States, Black liberation theology, and the long history of that, um, you know, in relationship to union, and even as Black Catholics have also, um, you know, espoused theology, Mary has not been a primary figure of reflection uh, in Protestantism. 
Um, I, I always joke that uh, Catholics like really literally enshrined Mary and Protestants were like, we'll just take your baby. Thank you so much for your service. <laughs> and so um, it, it seems a little bit odd uh, that I uh, have come to her, uh, but I, I find that she as the one who has given Christ uh, his flesh is a principal point of reflection in terms of theological anthropology. And what is interesting to me about um, Black Madonnas is that one, shrines of the Madonna have been, and, and devotion to, to Madonnas have been what have created the dogma of uh, the Roman Catholic Church around Mary. Uh, they have been sort of impressed upon by the devotion of the masses to have to respond in terms of ecclesial statements and authority in many ways. And so it's always interesting how movements of people push policy, if you will, but also the notion that there are these figures with black skin that are sacred already present in the Christian tradition uh, through moments of racial encounter and through our very trying, tragic and horrific histories of Christian colonial enterprise. So the fact that um, we have these moments or these figures of reflection that have been written off uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of the enlightenment, like, oh, well, these, these aren't holy images anymore. This is smoke damage. Or the, these are these aren't you know sacred mysteries of blackness. These are you know pigments changing because of chemical environments. Right. That sort of writing away to me is not only widely questionable, but is reflective of a kind of proto anti blackness um, as it emerged in in Christian colonial uh, execution. And so wanting to return to that um, as a theological source of construction and reflection means something in a world that is very anti-Black, uh, but also in a world that's continuing to deal with uh, sexism, uh, misogynoir, uh, issues around equity across multiple identities. And so for me, it's a really powerful site of theological reflection. That was a lot. <laughs> Thank you. No, you, but but very good. You said a, uh, a lot, yes, and it leads me to a couple of questions, and, and I, I want to get in a minute to this significance, but you also mentioned as people contemplate this Black Madonna that goes far back in, in history, uh, that they have often suggested as, as you uh, said that well, this is because of some chemical reaction that has occurred with uh, the painting itself or the image itself. And so, you know, and it's funny that it would occur with a black Madonna and it didn't occur with all these images of white Jesus. But, uh, and, and so they've suggested that rather than uh, really respecting the way in which that has long been a part of uh, Christian history, Western history, Western religious history. On the, as well as suggesting that these images come from uh, non-Christian uh, religious uh, uh, sources, and so goddess religions, et cetera, that which they may call pagan uh, religions, and then thus associate the Black Madonna with fertility cults and with breeding and the earth, et cetera. And as this happens, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Atkins Jones, does this not perpetuate uh, a trope or a stereotype in relationship to Black women uh, as the laborers, the breeders, uh, as the foils to uh, the pure uh, white woman who doesn't engage in this kind of earthy uh, work? Right. Um, I think it absolutely does, but I don't think that those are the only stories. Mm -hmm. And I will share two examples uh, from my forthcoming book, <laughs> even though I don't know when it is for me. But the book uh, title right now is Immaculate Misconceptions. And so one of the things that I've argued before, and there's some article forms of this, but one of the things that I've argued before is that one of the things, one of the images that does not necessarily travel to the United States um, uh, 
in, in its sort of colonization period, right? Like why, why does the Black Madonna not travel as a sacred image? I have an okay. argument about the rise of the mammy figure as a uh, sexual, yeah. as surrogate, as um, you know, sort of all all virtuous and performative and domic you know, docile as a body, um, sort of replacing that figure. And if we look at several films, Gone with the Wind and others, then you know, we can actually see some of these figures and um uh, actresses and in their sort of mammy role, they often will have a halo right oh. around them. Um, they will often have these sort of, you know, praying hands and looking up to heaven sort of moments, you know, as as proper uh, subjects, as proper maidservants or, bond, you know, bond slaves as uh, sometimes that Marian Magnificat is translated. Um, but to, to those other extents, um, I think that one of the other things that I sort of speak about and particularly around surrogacy is that so many of these black Madonnas, while they are, uh, representative of maternal figures um, as the Virgin Mary and divine motherhood is always articulated. What is perhaps more significant or at least has to also be considered is that many of these most popular shrines are sites of healing. Mm -hmm. They're sites where no one else could turn or no one else could go. And so what does it, what, what might healing or the capacity for communal reconciliation or joy um, how how is that tied to an an ethos of black life, and even as we are sort of stalked in our world by by black death, and so wanting to think about um, what is constructive, uh, specifically for black women's bodies, what does a consideration of the black Madonna have to say about consent? Have to say about maternal mortality, have to say about pain, have to say about suffering. Um, I think a lot and have spoken a lot about what does it mean to just want to mother and not want to mother a movement? What does it mean yeah. to have one's son executed unjustly by the state and you be made to watch and mourn on? What, what are these traditions and what, what are they calling us to be accountable for in our world? And how are they causing us are asking us to think different, differently about how uh, different kinds of bodies carry the divine within them, and also uh, how how we read that that divine economy against the sort of modes of consumption that seem to be all encompassing, particularly for for many uh, black women, black mothers, black birthing people, black black trans women. Um, uh, people who have black mothers across the board. And so wanting to think deeply about that. Oh my goodness, you have uh, said a lot. I love the way in which you lift up this reality of, uh, of a black mother, uh, black woman bringing forth life juxtaposed to uh, death, right? And the reality of of death, the the reality of healing, uh, in contrast to the reality of pain and suffering, and in all that you said, you're speaking of agency here, right? And so that in this regard, you know, it's not simply a black body being put upon, but having agency and even agency over the life that the the black Madonna. Uh, has in her hand. So it, and it is allowing us, it seems to me, just as you have said, to look into and peer into the reality of Black women's complex story uh, differently, overriding. So the Black Madonna overrides the image of Black Mammy and all of these other images that have overridden uh, the significance of the Black Madonna. And so it leads me to ask what you have in so many ways uh, just answered, but to uh, ask in a different way. So what you were saying to us is that this image of the Black Madonna has significance far beyond religion, right? And faith in that it's it's a sacred image that makes a history and a reality embodies 
even more sacred. So it seems that the Black Madonna is an image that we would want to particularly and intentionally begin to bring forward in such a time as we find ourselves. Your thoughts on that? I, I would argue as much and as so. And I think that one of the beautiful things about um, thinking about this kind of imagery is not only that often it is incredibly beautiful, right? Like there's so many images of, um, of you know, formal Black Madonnas, but also so many other images of Black Madonnas that have um, been very powerful in terms of um, capturing our imaginations of the sacred, in terms of capturing our imaginations of what is holy and really witnessing against um, the kinds of purity narratives, yes. um, the kind of purity ideas, or I sometimes talk about purity, the purity ideals that would delimit certain kinds of bodies um, in, in so many ways. But also, I mean, m much of this started for me with the question of trafficking and how certain kinds of bodies become available for consumption in the first place. Why are we able to dispose of, to consume, to discard certain kinds of bodies? And, and I say bodies uh, with the, you know, Robin, D.G. Kelly, you know, they aren't, we aren't talking about bodies, we aren't talking about lives. And it's like, yes, but white, whiteness has been talking about bodies. So right, to, right. to say that as I'm moving us toward thinking about lives, um, and, and wanting to say, well, how, how did we get here? And I think that um, um, recognizing the presence of the Black Madonna, I think that imagery, I think that considering, you know, who, who is iconic and not in terms of celebrity, but in terms of how we see um, sacrality, how we see ritual, how we see um, holiness in one another, um, and what that holds us accountable for is, is deeply beholden to the images that we see. It's deeply beholden to the way that images teach us and form us. And I'm interested in that formation. And, and particularly because I'm also deeply interested, not only in, I, I frequently say when I'm lecturing, holding Christianity accountable for his dreams as much as its nightmares. Yes. But I'm also interested in having different kinds of conversations that expand our imaginations outside of Christianity. So a lot of times, for instance, I will get, um, this just happens to be a teaching tool here. I get a lot of comments on um, this Black Madonna, but um, this is a Zeli Danto, uh, who is um, a Lua in, Haitian Vodou. And so wanting to think about other ways of engaging these different kinds of images and these questions or ideas around um, Black, holy, sacred figures. And for me, it, it's kind of, it's kind of obvious. This is, this is Mary's mama. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a Black Christ or anything else. Well, that, that means we got to talk about Black mamaing as well. And so um, for me, it's been it's been a really powerful um, and very easy turn um, uh, in conversation with literature and conversation with Black feminist thought and conversation um, with um, art history and art art um, and conversation with um, a multitude of Africana religious traditions as well. Can't wait. Uh, to read your book. And uh, there's no better time to begin to discuss the way in which Black bodies uh, are depicted. And you are so right that whiteness has uh, talked about and commodified and used and exploited the Black body and has not held sacred. Uh, black lives, and 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 this is uh, why we talk about the black body, which leads me to transition. Our so we can get to this for our time. Leads the way the black body uh, is uh, acted upon, if you will, in film, uh, and of course you've done a lot of work in this regard as well, in terms of technology and the way it's changed the way in which we view violence against black bodies. I. For instance, the viral videos of violent encounters between police and Black people. Now, I think on the one hand, without these videos, this reality of Black life would continue 
to go unnoticed, the George Floyd uh, lynching or the uh, Elijah McCain uh, murder would have never come to light. On the other hand, they run the risk of making us further immune to this anti-Black violence, regarding it as business as usual, while also inducing racialized trauma. So what are we to do? Can, can, can you speak to this? And let me bring, sort of combine it with an, uh, another question since uh, given our time, but relate it. This has come to light even more, not simply in regard to uh, these sort of viral uh, videos, but also as more and more movies depicting Black life and Black history emerge. And so there's controversy that has emerged around the Till uh, film and Emmett Till's lynching, right? And while the Till film doesn't show the actual lynching, of Emmett, it does show apparently, I haven't seen it yet, the open casket, which was a catalytic moment uh, in the in African American history and in our nation's struggle for racial justice, as was the George Floyd uh, film. So it's a catch twenty two here. Uh, what are we to do in relationship to depicting the realities of Black life, Black history, uh, and? the violence without triggering racial trauma and all of the other implications of that? Uh, I don't know <laughs> what we <laughs> are to do, but there are a couple of things that I have certainly been, been thinking about. Um, I, I will share a story. You know, I'm, I'm from the South and I'm from a very rural place. So um, I, I certainly, I preface this with we, we need far more gun control than we have yeah. and no one needs a semi-automatic rifle. That being said, I grew up around people who hunted, my family hunted. Um, and so I grew up around guns and I remember going, uh, my sister moved to Arizona. Arizona is a very different state. <laughs> and so I remember uh, she, uh, she was a member of a, like a gun range and we went to um, a shooting range. And I remember for the first time in my life seeing these like massive, um, massive uh, artillery weaponry <laughs> that people were shooting. And I was just completely shocked because those, that's not the, those are not the guns that I was ever around. And um, I remember looking at the targets that were available. And mm. obviously there were no black bodies but it was interesting that there were zombies mm -hmm. everywhere. And the point of this is that I have some different kinds of questions around how media forms our image, images of the other mm -hmm. and the other who is a threat. I teach a class called The Walking Dead and this is sort of feeds into a, this sort of project I'm thinking about in terms of how we see or how we witness evil how we see or witness dangers or threat. And so when I hear some of these testimonies from uh, police officers who have committed murder, um, uh, what the way that they felt or the way that they said that, you know, they were threatened frequently by children. When I think of Darren Wilson's testimony, mm -hmm. um, it, it's people are describing Black children, Black humans as moms. As beasts, right. As, as, as these sort of, you know, like we're in a video game and it was me versus them. It was, it was survive, even if someone is running away the opposite direction. Right. And so I have questions around what, what forms our notion of um, uh, this sort of ethical or justified violence, right? I talk about like in a zombie apocalypse, like what's murder? anymore right, right? like it's, it's survival so how how these ideas inflect us um or or are a part of our theological notions of human being mm -hmm. but when i when i also think about sort of the live film captures i i am very i am overwhelmed by the need for uh black people in particular um, but also not just black people, anyone in a mass shooting, right? To that even with all of the need to bear 
witness um, that seeing is not believing. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing these images and seeing death continues to uh, traumatize and re-traumatize um, uh, the people who've are the communities who've already experienced the loss and the threat and doesn't seem to be making an argument or being convincing enough for change um, for those who have the power to do something about it. And I think about Mamie Till, Mamie Till saying like, we will open this casket. Right. And the, significant, uh, the significance of those images as they were published, they were in jet, um, right. as they were circulated uh, to tell a story and to bear witness, but to also still have a question that begging recognition from the state is not something that is, is productive and tor uh, or has, has not yet seen a deep sense of productive um, response or a, a longstanding sense and catalyst for change in our in our society. So I started I started with zombies because I think that there's certainly lots and lots of psychological evidence of us seeing real life images and becoming completely desensitized to them. Images of war, images of mass trauma, images of blood and bodies broken and death, um, we are inundated with them. Uh, but also then to think the other sort of piece of that as the way that fantasy can create, you know, uh, images of possibility, but can also reiterate dystopias that distance us from other people in these different kinds of ways. And so we won't go into Fortnite. I will, I will <laughs> signal to our, our audience that, uh, Dean Douglas and I have had an extensive set of conversations <laughs> around Fortnite and children uh, and, and don't know where we land on that. But one of the things that's been very powerful so far, even, even now in our conversations with this cohort, is that many of us find films to be much more helpful pedagogically um, than sometimes the text, the text form, literary form, so many, um, so much of our reading is uh, very brief. Attention spans are different now. And so what sort of holds, um, holds and captures the minds and thus the hearts, the affect of, of a watcher is different um, than perhaps what it has been in other, other moments in time. But also some deep hesitations and questions about, well, how, how do we do this in a way that uh, honors life? How do we do this in a way that does not become, you know, what, what's the line for tragedy porn, um, so to speak, uh, and not. And so thinking through this with a group of people is something that um, in terms of the ethics and theology and sort of some of our different religious perspectives coming, coming to these scenes is really interesting. That being said, I haven't seen Till yet. And it is in part because I really struggle to watch images even in part, um, I, I find for myself that it's, I had to do a lot of work to prepare myself to watch movies in a way that I didn't have to at one point in time. And I think for me, as I've sort of processed, well, what is this? I used to, I used to be able to watch, it's Halloween time. I used to be able to watch horror movies. I used to love it. I used to love all the like, and I, and I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that what has happened is I've seen I've seen it in real time, and so for me, I can't watch uh, fictive uh, depictions in quite the same way or um, recreations of narratives in quite the same way because it's really difficult for me to detach those from reality and space. And maybe maybe that's part of the point. I will watch till at some point, but it takes a, a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, for me personally, and it's also just something that's that's on on my mind. Is there a way for us to? Is there for what? Is there a way for us? And this is my sort of theological question: Can we honor and respect and name suffering without also needing it to still be redemptive? Um, and I'm not sure uh, what that looks like or what that means yet. But that's. That's something I'm certainly committed to thinking about. Well, and that's a good place
for us to end with that question. And first I will say, uh, Amy Victoria, that I too find it very difficult to watch film uh, these days and have not yet seen Till. Uh, and, and it's my own sorting through, I think, racial trauma and just seeing too much of it. But a good place to end as we think about the power of film, the power of imagery, uh, and that is, is there a way to depict, and I will paraphrase you, the realities of Black life and Black suffering and its complexity without it having to be redemptive. Thank you for this conversation. I hope that you all get a taste of the kind of conversations we are having uh, in this cohort of uh, scholars of color that have come together to work through uh, these issues and to think about them in ways to expand our moral imaginaries of what is possible. And I look forward to sharing more of those conversations with you through our Just Conversations. I also invite you all back for my next Just Conversation this Friday, October 28th at 2.15 p.m., where I will speak about the upcoming election with Reverend William Barber from the Poor People's Campaign. Learn more in RSVP on the EDS at Union website. So this Friday on the 28th, as we talk about this important midterm election that is coming up. Thank you for joining us today and a special thanks to Dr. Amy Victoria Atkins-Jones. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>